it 7,000 square feet? 7,000 square feet. Uh, there you go. Get this easel. Get Anybody in the right mind can watch the Oh, yeah. Almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, that's right. Um, Wait till we have one more. your gavel, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> so, so folks, bear with us. <clears throat> we're, we're not a commission unless we have five people here, okay? So the first one is a votable topic, so we'll wait and hope that per fifth person shows up. Huh? Yeah. Got to have six. Well, I mean, the vote's fine. Yeah, five. Well, five, five does it, right? Yeah, five. Right. 
then everybody has to say yes. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. You're right. Especially if somebody's coming so late, like Rich. So if we just start, and we're going to have a word. Yeah, and then we can fill up with beer. Me. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Come on, this is as as you are now. So, I mean, I could actually, uh, it's been a while since I went to the list. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know which ones, but I don't like any of them. No, we got it on there. You don't have it on your phone? Start the meeting. Yeah, I think you could do it.
Are we already on? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, April 17th meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I will quickly go through a roll call. I'm here, Commissioner Harley. Uh, Tony Margiata. Here. Rich Roberts is not here as yet. We do expect him. Jim Hughes, not here. George Oichel. Here. Joe Hammer, we don't expect him. Tony O'Mickey, we don't expect him. Tom Dean, we don't expect Tom Dean. Ryan Allard. We do expect them, so we'll leave that open for the moment. Dave Edwards. Here. Uh, Yolanda is not here. Dan Silver is not here. So there are four, as everybody in the audience can see. There's only four of us. Uh, the rules of this commission are that five have to be here to vote and pass anything. Uh, so typically, you want six here to do anything like that. So honestly, um, we're just going to move on to the board and, and uh, you know, sit tight. The, the folks on the board and have agreed to sit down if, you know, when the people show up and we'll take the first agenda item, we'll go back, okay? So let's just let the board and talk to us because this is a pre-application review. It happens to be item, uh, what is it? 4.1 on the agenda, all righty? And would uh, Design Review like to come and sit up here so you can, it's up to you. I guess you can see it from both sides, right, if we're doing this? You know how this works. Introduce yourself and talk to the project. For the record, uh, Peter Alter. I'm a lawyer, practice law in Glastonbury. Uh, also present tonight uh, to introduce you informally to our proposal for the board at 1160 Silestine Highway. Uh, Attorney Megan Hope, um, the developer Marty Kenny. Our traffic consultant, Mark Fertucci of Fuss and O'Neill, and Kevin Johnson from Close Jensen uh, may offer some comments this evening. Just to uh, remind everybody, last year uh, we appeared before this commission and secured approval for the redevelopment of 1178 uh, Silasine Highway, um, also known as the Fun Zone. Uh, since that approval, uh, we have worked diligently to begin that development. Uh, it's obviously a very complex site and required a great deal of effort um, by uh, Marty and his development team to begin that development. We were approved June 6th of last year. You approved a five-story building with uh, retail space and a restaurant on the first floor, and then 111 residential units uh, on the second through fifth floor. You'll recall that uh, this site will offer a clubhouse, a fitness center, a rooftop lounge, uh, concierge services for residents, as well as a bike share and a dog park. One of the critical elements of that approval was this commission's review of the shared parking arrangement between 1160 Silas Dean, uh, the old equity bank office building, and 1178 Silas Dean. We presented a, a very uh, complete parking analysis done by Mark Fertucci to demonstrate that uh, we were able to adequately provide parking for both the uh, 1160 office use and the 1178 residential use uh, with a shared parking arrangement between the two properties. It included a number of site improvements within the parking lot of 1160 uh, to provide access to 1178 from Mill Street. Part of that development includes the widening of Mill Street by two to three feet to extend the west westbound left turning lane from Mill Street uh, onto the Silas Dean Highway. Since then, uh, OSTA has approved that project. Uh, we received that approval just uh, a week ago. Um, 
And one change that you should be aware of in that approval is that um, the uh, administrative approval indicated that the southbound entrance uh, for 1178 would be a write-in only, that there's no, will be no exit from the southbound entrance to the site. The exit onto the Silestine Highway is permitted only from the north uh, side of the building, that driveway. Uh, the south side driveway, which is pictured here, will be uh, right turn in only. Uh, so that's a minor change to our site plan. We're showing you these pictures just to remind you of the architecture and uh, scope and size of 1178 uh, as it was approved by this commission uh, last June. One of the concerns that uh, we had uh, and which required a great deal of negotiation by uh, Mr. Kenny was to make sure that we had a very firm and protective agreement of mutual cooperation between the property owners of 1160 and 1178. Uh, there came a time during that process where Marty was given the opportunity to acquire 1160 which would resolve uh, any issues that may have ever arisen between the two properties over uh, the operation of the, the mutual agreement that had been done. Um, Marty worked very hard in negotiating with the owners of 1160. He's reached an agreement to acquire the property um, and to completely redevelop it, as you'll see this evening. The change in use will go from uh, office use to mixed use. We will have the first floor with a dental practice medical office and uh, a real estate office maintaining their uh, presence at 1160 uh, Silestine. The second and third floors will be redeveloped into 39 residential apartment units studio units and one bedroom units of the square footage shown between 481 square feet and almost 900 square feet. The Quick question yes, on sir. that one, if you don't mind. No. Nope. Uh, the one bedroom, let's say the one bedroom units are one on each floor? No, no. There's, uh, oh, the break. Four of them? No, there are, there are a number of studios and a number of one bedrooms on each floor. We'll, we have a floor plan that you'll see. I saw it, but I, yep. I think that's what I saw was a one bedroom on each floor. Okay. We'll, we'll walk you through the design of the floor plan uh, in a little bit. One of the other changes, since uh, the bank will no longer operate there, we're taking out the bank drive through driveway that wraps all the way around the building. Uh, I reminded Mr. Oikel before the meeting started that he and I are probably the only people in the room that were here when the equity bank building was approved in 1988. Um, and at that time, it was designed for the purpose of the equity bank. And so the drive-through was an integral part of that approval. Uh, we now intend to remove the driveway that goes all around the building and convert the drive-through area into an outdoor amenity area for the residents to use. Uh, this adds the additional benefit of decreasing the impervious area and gives us an opportunity to create a landscape area along the Silestine Highway. Uh, you'll see from Kevin's plan that he's done a job of making that consistent with the 1178 landscaping and adding dramatically to or reducing dramatically the blacktop along the Silestine Highway. We have a loading space for residents to use adjacent to the building. And as a result of the changes, we've also been able to add some additional parking spaces near the building along with a new landscape plan. The area in, outlined in yellow is the 1160 property lines. Um, the blue line that you see about two-thirds of the way uh, to the bottom of the plan to the easterly, in the easterly direction is the 100-year flood zone. Um, we propose no wetland activities and no flood zone activities. Uh, 
uh, in our prior approval, you approved all of the wetlands agency and you approved all of the activities that will occur within the parking lot um, so that there are no changes to the plan that you approved uh, relative to the access to 1178 or the reconfiguration of the parking lot uh, yeah. in that area. This is a summary of the zoning table. Um, we are substantially in compliance with the expectations of the zone. Uh, I will point out that um, your maximum impervious coverage by regulation is 75%. The 1178 was at 72%. The proposal for 1160 reduces the impervious from the current 83% to 75.3. Uh, uh, 1160 was legally non-conforming as to your current regulation. It was developed before the regulation was in place. Uh, so we are reducing that non-conformity from 83% to um, 3 tenths of 1% from full compliance. We will be requesting a, a number of waivers. As I, I know the commission is familiar, you know that uh, under the regulations for this particular area, you have the authority to waive uh, any particular dimensional requirement uh, of the regulation. The waivers that we're asking for are not uh, Overly dramatic, I don't believe, but um, I'll summarize them very briefly. Um, we're 261 square feet short of meeting the requirement that at least 25% of the lot developed for non-residential use uh, be landscaped. So we're just barely short of the requirement. We would be required to have 19,800 square feet we have 19,539 square feet. So we're 261 square feet short. We have, uh, as commission will remember, um, these are two separate properties and they will continue to be two separate properties. Uh, you have a regulation that requires a five foot landscape buffer between side property lines um, and uh, we are proposing that that not be imposed in this particular development since they're integrated uh, as to parking and access. So we're going to ask for uh, a waiver of 4.1 feet of the 5 feet. We'll still have landscaping, as you can see, between the parcels, but it will not be 5 feet uh, in area or 5 feet wide. It'll be 4.1. No, it'll be 0.9. We're asking for a 4.1 foot waiver. Uh, it'll be wide enough to plant the trees that Kevin has, has shown there. Um, we, uh, so, so you are making more pavement. You're, I assume you're trying to get more parking? Or, uh, or does that exist there today, basically? It, it, that small? It's the way it is really today. Um, and uh, well, I shouldn't say that. The building, the current building on the fun zone really comes almost right to the property line. That's going to be raised. Um, and then the. <laughs> if the big is just up, up at the top, yeah. the rest is okay. The rest is, yeah. Okay. So I'm advised by people who know a lot more than me, apparently, that um, we, we don't need a waiver the full length of that boundary line, but only in the westerly end of it where. You're getting old, I I am getting old. There's no question of that. Um, and then uh, finally, um, we are not uh, going to meet the uh, required landscape area in the parking uh, lot with respect to curved islands. The requirement would be 8,001 square feet. We have 5,007. 5,781 square feet, so we're 2,220 square feet short of landscaped island. Um, so we would ask for a waiver of that. 
And finally, um, some of the islands are not 160 uh, square f or feet in width, so that um, we're proposing six islands that would have an area of less than 160 square feet, uh, and they would have a width of less than eight feet. We just don't have room and uh, to provide that size island and at the same time achieve the parking uh, that we're trying to achieve for the site. The um, only other comment I'd make before I ask Mark Bertucci to come up to work his way through the uh, traffic information is um, we did see the memo from uh, Derek Gregor uh, on a preliminary basis and uh, he indicated a concern about the three parking spaces that show up um, ahead of the building setback line up in the very upper left-hand corner of the 1160 property. Um, those spaces were approved in the 1178 approval. Th those are not new parking spaces. Were, yeah. We had gotten a waiver of those before. I'm sure that he forgot that. But well, I what's just, his concern? I'm sorry? What's well, his concern? His concern is that he, he doesn't like parking spaces ahead of the building towards the Silas Dean Highway. Um, but well, those no were driveway there, so. no, and we do have a little hammerhead turnaround that no. that he suggested uh, as well. Okay. With that, uh, I'm going to ask Mark Bertucci to come up. He was did our traffic analysis in the first instance, and then was asked by us to continue that effort uh, in terms of this analysis. Sure. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm Mark Fertucci again. I'm a senior transportation engineer at uh, Fuss and O'Neill. And which way am I going? The wrong way. <laughs> um, so I just uh, I wanted to describe uh, uh, briefly the findings of our traffic and uh, parking study update uh, that we prepared for uh, the proposed change in use at 1160 Silas Dean. Um, the, uh, the letter update, uh, we're actually uh, going to be submitting that as dated today, um, but we basically, we reviewed the, the traffic impacts and then also uh, the changes to our shared parking analysis from what we had uh, originally uh, looked at about a year ago. Uh, looking at the traffic uh, impacts first, um, the existing uh, general office space use uh, on 1160 Silas Dean there's about 31,200 square feet of office there. Um, if you use industry standard ITE trip generation rates, uh, that office generates uh, about 36 vehicle trips during the uh, commuter peak hours. Uh, with the proposed uh, change in use, uh, we're going to end up with uh, about 27, 2,800 square feet of general office and 3,800 square feet of medical dental office on the first floor of 1160. And then those upper floors are the 39 residential apartment units. Uh, so you can see up on your screen uh, the trip generation rates associated with those uses. And if you total them up, it's about 26 trips in the morning peak hour and 31 trips in the afternoon peak hour. Uh, so it's about a 10 trip reduction uh, in traffic during both of the peak hours as a result of this proposed change in use. So. Um, we didn't reanalyze intersections uh, from the previous traffic study, given that the trip generation is actually going down. So that previous analysis uh, uh, we consider uh, is, is pretty conservative. Can you explain back going to the 39 units? You're saying only 10 vehicles are exiting out of the 39 units? Well, I'm familiar with the IT generation thing, but I'm just curious about the why is only 10 out of the 39 units actually leaving in the morning? Yeah, so you know the trip generation, it looks at uh, the peak hour. So when you say, you know, if we're to assume that um, all 39 people leave, they don't necessarily all, uh, all leave in the peak hour. It's typically spread out over a, you know, mu multiple hour period during the, uh, the peak. So this is just our peak uh, trip generation. 
Uh, you know, and it's also possible some of these people aren't, they're not leaving, they don't work or they work from home. Um, so these are, these are just a compilation of average rates in the IT manual for, um, I, I believe there's uh, a couple hundred of the data points uh, that they've taken uh, actual counts at similar uh, apartment uses around the country to come up with these rates. And I should mention this is the uh, Trip Generation Manual 10th edition, which was just recently issued by ITE. It's an update to their previous manual, so it has uh, fresh and new information in it. Um, moving on to the parking. So I, actually, let me just ask oh, one sure. question about that, too. Um, <clears throat> what would the, I don't know the book as well as he does. Um, what would the range normally be for the office versus a doctor's? You get four and six. Um, what would be a normal range? And the, where I'm heading here is what if those change to something else? Would it in fact increase it or would it decrease it if the range is two to 10? Probably not. Did I get my you, point? You mean the, the office and uh, dental office use? Basically office use, yeah. What is the general range if they chose to to change the office, use the general to something else. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be office related, clearly, right? But what else could it be and what might those generation rates be? Well, I mean, Which, generally the office, the medical dental office are, are much higher traffic generators than, than residential. I mean, if, I, if your question is if it's a different type of office. Yes. Um, it, you know, we use the general office rate. Um, that would, it's pretty much an all encompassing for different types of offices. Um, you know, there, there, there's a few other uses in ITE, like, uh, uh, you know, a single tenant or medical dental office and that, that have slightly different rates, but they're all in the same. Same ballpark, four, ballpark. To, four six, eight, somewhere in that range. Right. Probably, right. right? Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. And, and also then, I'll, I'm going to put you on the spot by trying to get you to explain the table. Okay. The shared parking table? Okay, yeah, I, that is coming up oh, in a couple then I'll, of, then I'll let you go there. Couple go of ahead. slides. Go I'll, I'll be getting to that shortly. Um, so the, moving on to the parking, you know, back in uh, about a year ago, um, we had approval for our shared parking analysis that we had uh, prepared for the 1160 and 1178 um, properties. And uh, just recapping what that analysis showed, you know, the basic tenant behind what we did was we have an office use on 1160 and we have a, a residential use on 1178 and also some uh, a retail restaurant component and uh, you know those uses all generate uh, peak parking demand at different hours of the day. Um, so they're, they're complementary in nature where the office peaks in, during the day, the residential will peak during the night. Um, so when you go hour by hour during the day and look at the, the parking demand for each hour uh, during the day, uh, we, our, this parking study calculated what the peak parking demand was each hour of the day so that we could determine what amount of parking we actually need. We don't, we don't need all the parking that each of the individual uses would uh, uh, require by zoning regulations because, because of the shared uh, nature of the use. Uh, so the study that we had prepared um, projected a, a peak shared parking demand during the day of 257 spaces. We provided 281 spaces on the site, so we had a net excess of uh, 24 parking spaces. So what we did is we, um, we went ahead and we updated that shared parking chart uh, with the proposed uh, uses now on 1160 that I, that I had discussed. Um, we also factored in that one of the uses on 1178 Silas Dean, the uh, smaller uh, retail use, uh, would be a typical nine to five type use. Wouldn't be generating traffic in the, uh, it's not expected to be generating traffic in the evening hours. So when you factor um, that in, um, our peak demand, shared parking demand is now projected to be 278 spaces around seven o'clock in the evening. And we now have a, a total project, a total amount of parking provided on the site went up. We, we gained a space for the latest layout is 282, so we have four excess parking spaces is what the latest analysis shows. And this is, again, based on um, occupancy rates in the ULI manual. It's the Urban Land Institute 
which is um, uh, a resource for determining shared parking generation. And as I'll describe in a minute, it's a very conservative method uh, for projecting shared parking because a lot of the residential data in that manual is from more urban areas where uh, you, you see people leaving their car uh, in the development uh, more uh, frequently during the day than you would, uh, say, in a suburban apartment style um, type use because they, you know, in an urban area you get more people who are walking or biking to work or they're working from home or they're taking the train. They don't necessarily get out and, um, you know, use their car to and from work every, every day as much as you would uh, see in a suburban area. So given, given that, uh, how conservative those ULI rates are, we, um, and, and this, this uh, first bullet really shows you what I'm talking about. Uh, it projects uh, peak parking occupancy at a residential development um, of 85% at 5 o'clock in the evening, ramping up to almost 100% by 7 to 8 o'clock. And what we see in, you know, in this area, if you look at an apartment complex, you, you don't see that everybody's back home uh, in their apartments uh, that early in the evening. You know, you typically, if not everybody just comes right home to, from work at 5 o'clock. They may go out and, uh, you know, go stop at the store or go out to dinner or, or w whatever they might be doing. But um, it's, it's not as a common in a suburban uh, apartment use to, to, to see uh, nearly 100% of, the, of uh, the parking occupancy is taken up that early in the evening. Um, so what we did is we actually counted uh, a couple other developments uh, in the area, the Village at Weathersfield Apartments uh, and the Colonial Arms Apartments uh, back on March 6th. We did a parking occupancy count in the early evening hours and what we actually found was the occupancy rates were much lower than the ULI uh, projection. And you can see they were only 29% at 5 o'clock in the evening, ramping up to 51% at 8 o'clock. And that's the average between the two developments. So it did confirm our, uh, our belief that those ULI rates were, were uh, pretty conservative in nature. So what we did is we uh, went back and we recalculated um, the parking occupancy rates between 5 and 8 o'clock by averaging those counts at those two developments with the ULI occupancy rate, so still being pretty conservative. And we got the, that last bullet there on the screen, um, we got occupancy rates ranging from 57% at 5 o'clock, ramping up to 74% at 8 o'clock. So Is that based on 51% of the parking spaces or 51% of the actual cars? So if you were there at 11 o'clock and there was double that amount of cars there at 11? Yeah. It's 51% of the uh, parking space, so the 57% of the total parking spaces provided on the site, 57% of them had a, had a vehicle parked in them. And we did check that the parking spaces provided on each of the sites were consistent with what was required by the zoning regulations. So the parking provided was, you know, your, your, um, I'll show you here on the next. Uh, so you one and a half spaces ever at 100 percent? Pardon? What are those parking spaces ever at 100 percent? You're just look, looking at the available parking spaces versus what the actual use is. No, the use is residential. No, so right. right. I mean, you didn't go there at 11 o'clock and said there was 100 cars at 11, but at 8 o'clock there was only uh, 51. Oh, yeah, we, we didn't count all the way up to 11 o'clock. So just a parking space. We, we only looked at 5 to 8 o'clock just because that, that's the uh, kind of the critical overlap period between when we have the retail office and residential uses over, you know, competing, where those uses would be competing for parking yeah. on the site. By the time you get later in the evening, it, uh, we know we have enough parking. I guess my point is I don't know if those apartments are fully occupied, whether they're only 60% occupied. Okay. Just to make sure your study is right. Okay. I'm sorry. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. They were. They're both fully occupied. Okay. Those are. They're fully rented out. Both of those uses. Okay. Um, so this uh, next slide is the um, shows our calculation with the, the ULI rates. So this is without factoring in the counts we did. And you can see, you know, down from 5 to 8 o'clock, we've got those 85 to 98 percent, those conservatively high rates. 
And uh, we come up with the shared parking demand there in the lower right corner of the chart of 278 spaces. And so even doing it with straight ULI rates, we show that we have uh, sufficient uh, parking on the site. We have four excess spaces versus what's provided. Uh, but then when we go and we um, redo this chart, uh, looking at the uh, factoring in the observed utilization rates between 5 and 8 <coughs> o'clock at the local developments, and you see in the lower uh, right-hand corner of the chart, we're at a peak share demand of 256 spaces. Um, so we actually uh, end up uh, looking at it that way. We really have 26 excess parking spaces, which is around the same uh, amount of excess parking spaces we had projected uh, with our original study, uh, an original proposal a year ago. So, um, you know, I guess the moral of this is that, um, you know, we feel there's, there's uh, ample, still ample sufficient parking on the site. Uh, the shared demand is uh, uh, a fair amount less than the actual parking that we're uh, providing. And um, that the conclusion of our study, which, which I said, as I mentioned, will be submitted uh, uh, shortly, is that um, uh, there will not be a, the uh, significant increase in traffic as a result of the, actually there's a decrease in traffic as a result of this <coughs> proposed change in land use and there is adequate uh, parking supply um, based on the, uh, what is proposed at 1160. And I know um, you had a question on the, uh, the shared chart, so I'm gonna go back to that. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, just looking um, to the to the right of the rights. Well, just look at the real estate at 1160, or the dental office. Right. None of those ever get to 100 percent at any time of the day. So, what would you? How would you explain that to me? You'll notice that the retail spaces at the other one reach 100, which is perfectly reasonable. That's why you have a four space per thousand or six space per thousand that at some point during the day <clears throat> you get up to those six spaces per thousand a hundred percent those don't even come close now it's not going to change what you're suggesting to us it just looks funny yeah yeah though so again these these rates are all taken from the from the uli uh, manual so it's uh it's average rates from uh, similar developments and they they take the, um, you know, the, the, the occupancy rates during the course of the day and average them what uh, you would typically see for a percentage uh, as you go throughout the course of the day. So these percentages you're seeing there are percentages of um, what would be required by your zoning regulations, which is four per thousand and six per thousand for dental office. So the ULI manual is saying <coughs> we're not actually seeing when we go out and count these developments, we're not actually seeing those rates. So, you, uh, so thank you. So that's the answer, right? The four and six are, your, uh, I'm sorry, the women, the four and the six are our numbers in our planning book? So those percentage, those? right, so those percentages, so for instance, uh, you know, at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon for the real estate office, for, yes, for instance, it's 45%. Uh, five spaces occupied, so the f that that's forty-five percent of eleven spaces, which is what uh, is required by your zoning regulations based on four spaces per thousand square feet. So, so for I, I twenty-seven hundred square foot re uh, real estate office. And and, and clearly, it, it may be something I'm not understanding right. <clears throat> but if the four and the six come out of this manual. And that same manual says during the day, they're obviously not always at the peak. I get that, right? But at some point or other, they get to the peak or else it wouldn't be a, a rate. Well, well, yeah, what I was saying is the four, so the four, yeah, the four <coughs> and the six is your regulation, right? Uh, is your... Is that my regulation? It, yes. It is. It's yeah. not in the book. Correct, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say the same thing about the other ones? Because that does get to the... To the hundred percent, which makes logical sense. Are you with me? Right, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's um, the other ones. Uh, yeah, so a hundred percent is for the um, right. Those are um, those other retail uses are that's re general retail and restaurant space. So we do see that those uh, those would, those go up to a hundred. I mean, the the restaurant space at around lunchtime is a peak period. So you know you would see that. 
uh, approaching peak demand at that point in time. So we'll turn to Peter and tell him that he should be cutting back our requirements on the office space. <laughs> All right. And I have a quick question. The circled in red percentages, that's the reduced rates from your study, right? And if you increased it back to what the uh, code says, what would happen to the table? Uh, so that that's was, the, that was the last one. That's the, last the table uh, that previous table okay. here, right. the ULI table. So what happens to it is we end up with a shared demand of 278. So it still works, but you only have a four space buffer as compared to the, the, the peak is the peak space right. Buffer. The peak demand is five, six, seven, eight o'clock. That's why they're trying to downplay that. Yeah. Yeah. Retail space two has after six o'clock <coughs> zeros out. Is that no control? You over rent it and that. Be open past that time. Cor that's correct, right? Okay, I'm just I'm sorry, you threw in those numbers. Yeah, just, the, uh, would it throw it off? I mean, it's like you're talking 14 more spaces added per hour. I'm just wondering. If it the the expectation is that would be a, a, a more general, typical retail use that's open like a nine to five type ske schedule. I, I think the the other one is proposed to be a hair salon, which is going to have um, appointments into the evening. So that one um, will be generating later. Yep. It's all a bit of guesswork anyways, but, but still, I, I think what we're hearing is that it's kind of close. It's kind of close, right? And that uh, <clears throat> they're proposing that it probably is a conservatively high number based on realities of checking some of the local places. Right. Yeah, the main point of this exercise is just to show <coughs> we, we feel it works, but um, you know, in counting the, the developments, we think we, we actually have a lot more buffer than the industry standard analysis would, would indicate, but it does work either way when we run the numbers. And I will <coughs> turn it back to Peter. Thanks. Thank um, one of the reasons why we had Mark go through this exercise was that one of the conditions of approval that this commission imposed when we had the 1178 uh, approval before you was a condition that says, as a result of the parking space reduction approved under the sections of your regulation and further provisions of section 10.1e, any change in commercial tenancy for either 1160 or 1178 shall be reviewed by the CEO and may be referred to the PZC for further review. So we wanted to bring that to you right up front so that you could see because of the change of use that we've done the analysis again uh, in terms of the parking requirements uh, for these two combined uh, parcels. <clears throat> the development of 11, redevelopment of 1160 we think is, is very consistent with the Silas Dean vision uh, that is spelled out we think that uh, as you look at the architectural changes and um, the development of 11, redevelopment of 1160, you'll see that uh, a great deal of thought and effort has been put into meeting the standards and expectations of the guidelines that uh, have been set for the Silestine Highway. Um, 1160, uh, is due for redevelopment. It was built in the late 1980s. It, it needs uh, to be refurbished. It, it needs a lot of work. Uh, Marty has done a complete analysis of the building to the point where it needs a new roof. It needs new mechanical systems. Uh, it's ready for all of that. So this is an ideal time uh, for him and, and his group to go in there and, and completely refurbish and redevelop the site uh, consistent with the expectations that the community has expressed uh, with respect to uh, the guidelines and objectives that you have for the Silestine Highway. Uh, I'm going to, the same architect who provided us with the design of 1178 is working on 1160. Unfortunately, he had. Uh, a medical issue, so he wasn't able to be here tonight. So Marty Kenny uh, really is the most familiar with his 
his plans for 1160 is going to take you through the architectural design that uh, he's come up with. So, <coughs> so, so Peter and Marty, if you'll bear with me just a second. Um, the applicant who's here for the other... Yeah. You know, I, I apologize, and I'm kind of embarrassed for the commission, but I'll leave it up to you if you want to hang around. I, you know, I don't know where they are. Would you look inside them? <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's where Peter... Either, but I, I, mean, I, I can wait. We've left messages for both and yes, haven't heard back yet. So, yes, we can do. yeah. So, I'll get it. That's fine. I don't need to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I apologize. Our architect isn't available today. So, I might be uh, mixing in a little of the business logic with the architectural changes. You're not a registered architect. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> so, so, you know, as, as Peter mentioned in the beginning, um, by purchasing both these, these properties, which is, you know, a much greater commitment uh, to the town and to the site than we originally uh, considered. But we really think it's an opportunity to really do this right. And, you know, getting the highest best use, which is a combination of ground floor office and apartments from an economic standpoint, the apartments uh, um, generate a third more than office rental for B space would. So economically, it makes sense. It encourages us to do all the things we have to do, which, as Peter mentioned, because of the age of this building, new roofs, new building systems, uh, new window glazing. And then it was an opportunity architecturally to marry both of these properties together so they look like they were always meant to be. And Enjoy new windows then? No, we're, we're, we're doing caulking and, and some oh. ceiling work, which is, which is needed. Um, so, so what we tried to do is we, we tried to um, take some of the architectural features from the Borden and integrate them, uh, particularly on the west and south facades. And what you see here is we have um, on the facade of, of the Borden, which we had shared with uh, the design review people and everyone else that we wanted a vital, iconic uh, sort of vision for this property to attract the people we want to live here, which are renters by choice, um, be it young millennials or the young at heart. And I think we're, we're, we're drawing from both of those folks. And so architecturally, the idea was to take some of the metal uh, panels that we have the gray metal panels that we showed you, and then that wood grain uh, feature, which is called Trespa, which uh, we, we've incorporated it on the west elevation, where you see the top hat of the building, which reflects what we're doing over from the top down. You'll then see those gray metal panels. They look a little tan here, which, which I think is a PowerPoint issue as opposed to uh, the actual colors. They're, they're, they're gray. And, and if, you, if, if you look at where Peter's pointing, the Trespa panels um, separate those metal panels right up there. Uh, and so they're below, and those are the same materials that we have uh, in the board. And, and the, the top hat, if you will, um, is, is up top. That, that's uh, raised three feet as, as the uh, tops of the towers that we have uh, in the Borden building at 1178. So, you know, it's an integrated look, and, and you see that from the Silas Dean, and you see it from the south elevation that fronts into 1178 over there. Um, so, so that system, and Craig, you tell me if I get this wrong, but it's, it's a heavy uh, gauge metal uh, system, and, and these uh, metal panels and the Trespa are attached and they, they jut out about eight inches from the facade. So it's, it's decorative, it, it, it sort of stimulates, while not taken away from what I think is a beautiful brick building. So it, it just sort of integrates all those features. And then um, when, we, when we get down to, uh, you know, Webster Bank had left and there is this pavilion for the, for the drive-in center, um, so we sort of challenged the design team, both from a landscaping standpoint, how can we, you know, with, with 39 uh, residents in the buildings, 
how can we create a feature that, that works for not only the residents, but also the, uh, the, the office occupants during the day to have a patio area that would have um, a fireplace. It would be a propane uh, fireplace and then, and then have um, a, uh, a grilling area and, and utilizing the drive-in window space to encase a flat screen TV so that would be built into the building so that that could be utilized uh, during during lounge hours and and this could actually be an area that's not only used by um, the residents in 1160 but of course the residents in 1178 as well so the idea is to kind of marry it not only uh, um, physically but socially as well so they could have some party out there small party out they, it, it would be a gathering. It, you know, I, I don't think it's meant to be a party place. The, the, no. If they were going to have a party, it, it, the place to do it is in our clubhouse with our rooftop area. The parties won't be happening there. But it, but it will be an area to, you know, to, to relax and everything else. One of the other features that uh, we're working on, and, and you're going to see a, uh, our sign uh, person when we have the public hearing May 1. The sign that we had off of 1178, uh, we're going to have a similar sign in the corner of the west and south elevation there. So, so that 1160 and 1178 will be shown as you drive in. And of course, the signage for the board and entry will be in there as well. So people will be able to know, uh, you know whether they live in 1160 or 1178 or they're visiting, they'll know which building that is. Is your sign going to be much different uh, when you come in with it, or no? They're going to they're going to mirror the sign on eleven seventy eight where we showed the board, and we're going to bring uh, by May one. We have our, our sign consultant working now in a full package in accordance with your latest regulations. So, so you, you see the trespa that that wood grain. Uh, one of the buildings I that I've seen it on recently around here was when they redid Glen Lockin, that material was used. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's very attractive and um, unfortunately sometimes on the PowerPoint it looks like an orange blot, but it, it actually has some grain to it and it's, it's, it's a good look. So, so this, this is the uh, entry area from, from the parking lot. Um, on the east side of the building, and, and again, we'll, we'll be having the uh, the metal clad material on the front. We'll we'll have some of the trespa, and then we'll have some lantern lighting. So this still looks professional, but but it also warms it up a little for the for the residential users uh, on floors two, three, and four. And that, of course, is the elevation that fronts Mill Street um, to the north. And, and we're not doing anything here. I mean, you know, this, put, putting this facade in and making it all work um, was, was not in the original plan, as my general contractor can tell you. Um, but I think it's important. It's important to, to make this all sort of sing together and, and um, ha have the kind of community that we want to have between the two buildings. What else you got? So let, let's talk about the interiors here. And, and since we talked about the, huh? since sorry. you were talking about the architectural stuff, do you guys have any comments in particular? Design review. Design review. Okay. Sure. Okay. There's no, you know, that great question, and thank you for asking that, because um, uh, Dr. Dolan and his team who are moving down and taking all 3,800 square feet and expanding their practice, the front entry there will not uh, be a door opening because that will be the dental space. So, so there will be no door openings there.
I'm going to take that under advisement with my AIA architect, but that's a, <laughs> that's a reasonable suggestion. Yes. We'll be showing that in the. Uh, so the sidewalks are on a site plan to work. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, the next package. Can you also give us elevations with the two buildings, front facades? Because this seems, perspective seems a little off. There's 130 feet between the buildings according to the site plan. That seems like that's much farther in that perspective. So could you give us? Front facades right next to each other in the next package. Okay. You, he's looking for the perspective. His feeling is that 1160 seems farther away yeah, from 1178. Is but on the site plan it measures out at 130. Feet. There's also a lot of trees on the Marshall site yeah. there too. So, yeah. you know, part of that is is generated by by digital. So, let me. Okay, so, so first, on this is a typical floor, and the total unit mix is 24 studios and 15 one-bedrooms. And the one-bedrooms are located in the four corners, and then in the middle, on the east elevation, that you'll see the one-bedroom there. And, and the remainder are studios. And, um, you know, the, the, this type of unit has the highest demand that we're seeing in all the projects that we're doing around Hartford County. And we, th we think it's a great opportunity, and I'll, I'll show you with the interiors, um, with the high ceilings that are in the office space, with, with the concrete floors, um, to, to get a really cool looking unit with exposed spiral duct, um, high ceilings. Um, this sort of gives you, this is a, a representation and we actually have designed in and, and we're looking at installing in the studios Murphy beds that are up against, you see it up against the wall that could come out at night. Um, Murphy beds have come a long way in the last 30 years, by the way. Um, but they're, they're used all the time. And um, this, is, this is another visual where you see the bed unit uh, come out of the wall and then it goes back up during the day and uh, you can't believe uh, the studios are the fastest selling component um, that we have for renters by choice. The demographics are pro approximately 24 years old to 30, <coughs> 22 to 30, and uh, the demand is insatiable. Size of the studio? Size of the studios are approximately 480 to 525 feet right in there. And the ones are in the uh, high 600s uh, to 7, 780, I believe. Could you back up two slides? I, I just want to see the right there. Which is the east elevation? The one with the elevator. That's the east side. Uh, the the, the, you see the elevator right there? This is the east over here. East is to the right? Yes. The east elevator? Yep. The elevator is down there, see? Yes, right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. East, east is to the right. One of the things we're doing with it, you know, with the office windows, uh, one of the um, interior things that we're going to have on these are solar blinds that, that run from the top of the window down. So they'll all be uniform. Even though the windows have a tint, um, it's, it's a nice look. It's, it's a more expensive window treatment, but but it really uh, is, is um, desirable when you look at these, these windows. Okay. I'm just trying to get a, because I've never been in the building, I was yeah. getting, trying to get a lay of the land for where the staircase is. So the staircase. The staircase comes out right down where here. the patio is on the, uh, on the ground say, level. So we're basically down here is the board. Correct. Right? Okay. So this, and, and the staircase faces the board and Mill Street. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So um, this, is, this is actually the first floor, which shows the real estate office 
in blue, and, and then Dr. Dolan's space in the, uh, the maroon color, and then the purple shows the outdoor patio. And, th and this is a, a sort of a rendered layout of, of how we see the, see the patio area. And um, you see the grilling area uh, in the forefront there. And then you see where the television's located, where, um, where the teller uh, area was. And that gives you a rendering. Those, those lights are decorative, and we probably have them out during the summer months. But that just gives you a sense, and, and the, uh, the, the floor coverings are stamped comp concrete that will be in a brick color and a concrete color and will be uh, uh, patterned. And then you see the brick piers that have lanterns on top um, with, with the same sort of fencing that we'll be having over at the Borden's restaurant area. And I believe, Kevin, the landscaping uh, uh, is very similar to what we have going on across the street to again tie in everything. So just, just to tell you what our timing is, we have a uh, public hearing for May 1st. You know, our hope is to close on the prop, both properties in mid-May. And, and this is the, uh, the construction period for both 1178 and, and 1160. Um, Silas Dean. Since we're, we're talking about 1160, you know, our, our immediate plan upon purchase is start, starting to prepare um, the uh, ground floor area, the, the dental space, to convert that um, over the summertime so that by around October 1, we can do a turnkey move-in for, for the dental group. Um, we, we will also be working on, on the roof replacement. Um, we do have some month-to-month -month tenants who we are working very closely with right now uh, in the space to relocate them. We're helping them uh, with their searches. Um, we're, we're helping them with some of their moving costs. Uh, all these, uh, there's four uh, remaining uh, tenants, office tenants, and, and we're, we're trying to relocate them in Weathersfield, quite frankly. It's get, our office market's getting a little tighter. Um, so so it's, it's a, it was a lot to take on as opposed to just doing one project. But, I, I, again, I think the end result will be worth it. You can put up a new office building. <laughs> you haven't seen an office building built in quite some time in, in Hartford or, in fact, Connecticut. It's... It's not easy to make it work, and that's, that's why this change is good for the vitality of this center, and it puts feet on the street. You know, just on the board, and the, the, the plan is in May, we, we have some remediation work to do with hazmat and asbestos and lead, and um, the, uh, the folks in the white suits will be in there doing their thing, and um, uh, our construction team hope, hopes to uh, start demolition work in June and to, to have that demolition work done in the end of June sometime in July and, and then we will, we, we will start, start in on the site work. So, so that's the plan and, and overall we'll, you know, the, we're hoping to deliver the apartments in 1160 by May of next year, about one year out from you know, now. When's your demolition breaking of the fun zone? May, June. June. You know, June. depending. Well, the, we can't do any of it until we, until we clean up. It showed May on 78. We st uh, no? No. May, we're doing environmental remediation. Yeah, okay. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. That's on 1160. Correct. Yeah, Correct. But the, no, 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 no. The fun no, zone, there's no, when are you going to start on that? 1178 is where we're doing the remediation work. We don't have to do remediation work in the office building. Okay. Okay. Anything else? So, uh, I don't know if there's more to the presentation. I guess. No. I mean, that's all we have for this evening. So, so we're seeing a lot of residential apartment proposals. And when I say a lot, I guess four immediately come to mind, this being two, and we've already approved two others. 
Um, you know, I heard you say insatiable, but um, how do we know? Because none of them hit the market yet, right? We just got three and, and potentially now four planned. Um, how do we know if it's in fact satiable? Um, <laughs> I, I can, Marty will speak to that from the business side. I can tell you that in Glastonbury we had 500 units approved and under construction. And um, one project was Marty's, the tannery, and 250 units is full. The other project, large project, is on the corner of House Street and Hebert Avenue. As each building gets a CL, it's fully occupied. Marty did the, the mill at, on, in Addison. And again, as soon as it was available, it was fully occupied. There has been a change in the market from people who simply don't want to own a house. And, and that uh, I'll, I'll let Marty speak to his experience, but it's been, it's, it's really uh, quite substantial in terms of what the market has turned into. So just to give a, a balanced view, does that mean all sub-markets are gonna be like that? No, but I think when you find centrally located towns with good highway access and projects that or in a town center environment or an urban environment, that's that's where people want to live. And Peter's right, it took us, uh, at the tannery, we leased up 250 units, including selling out our 43 studios in three weeks time in last May. Um, so we had absorption, if you do the math, we opened in March, we completed the tannery in September, and, and by November we were over 90% occupancy. We opened last year in Windsor uh, Center, Windsor Station, uh, which is by the train station and town center there and adjacent to Loomis Chapin. We had 130 apartments, mostly studios and ones there with uh, 32 out of 130 being two bedrooms. Those were all leased up by October. We were at 95% occupancy. I look at some markets like Simsbury, which has had an exceptional amount of multifamily for you know, a sing, a, what was traditionally a single family home. And, you know, areas like that, if the building keeps going, they, I think there's some legitimate concerns because, you know, their location via the highway network is a little less desirable. But on the short term, there's much more demand and it doesn't really have a lot to do with job growth. It ha what it has to do with You've got, in Hartford County, you've got 39, uh, you've got 40,000 apartments, 4,000 of them have been built since 2010. And when you take the 36,000 that remain, 80% of those 36,000 units were built before 1980. So, you, and then you look at renters by choice, are they gonna live in a class C apartment with a slide-in uh, air conditioning unit with no amenities, with a with a you know with an aged carpet, it, it's just not what people are looking for. So, um, you know, the real question is, what happens to this older product, and right. and who lives there? What are you going to do about that? Some of the older apartments, well, even along the side of the scene. That's Peter's job, not mine. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> so that is but that is part of what I encourage you to be part of it. I guess my follow-up question to Tom is, uh, you know, do we start with all these residential units coming in? Should we start thinking about building the schools? But in all seriousness, I know the last time for I believe the 1176 guys had a really good uh, person come up talk about the you know, millennials are going to be in here, uh, you know, no children. Uh, so I think you know again with the app actual application, I think that was a, that was a good uh, good thing to have again for this application. And you know, again, I know it's a study, but I'd like to see your other units. You know, what kind of tenants are they actually drawing in Glastonbury? So it's not just a theory; it's actually a true. You know, percentage of uh, you know renters that have children versus not children. So um, the, the Glastonbury demographic is interesting because you know in Windsor, where we're close to uh, Day Hill Road, uh, and a lot of the the Hartford and uh, Voya Financial, and um, most of our residents there are pure millennials, 32 and under. Um, in Glastonbury. Our, our demographic is approximately 50% empty nester, 
um, people that um, if they're not retired, they're winding down. Um, they're people that often have homes. Uh, 50%? Uh, yeah, 50%. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and then the, the remaining in Glastonbury are, are young professionals. Pratt and Whitney, you know, people don't realize because, you know, the Hartford Current's always talking about the negative. But if you saw what's going on in hiring with Pratt and Whitney and the kind of youth that, you know, we haven't seen in, I grew up in Glastonbury. And in the 70s, there was a flurry of engineering jobs for young professionals that, that grew that town. And, and we're, we're sort of seeing that again. And what we're really seeing, though, is we're seeing people that want to live in a place for other reasons, to have amenities like we have there, to have, you know, a beautiful gym that they can work out in, a community room where we, we have functions, you know, a couple times a month. Pe people want a lifestyle. You know, and they see what we're doing, you know, on the internet. We, we had a St. Patrick's Day party. Uh, we had 150 people there. Um, it was an amazing what, event. What, what did you mean before? This is the key to what you're saying now, because I think it goes beyond your location, per se. Pedestrian friendly uh, design, design. What do you mean by that? Don't you mean more than just your building, the parking lot? You mean the area and the amenities around it? Yes. Like the, uh, you know, the workout zones nearby, the That too, buildings, absolutely. The, it's, that kind of it's thing. It's very important, can, you know, having Panera there? Bread right down, having Starbucks right next door. Do you think this, people want to walk on the Silestine uh, sidewalks? I, I, think, I think we can get there. You do? I do. Okay. I, now, think, I think from a t town standpoint, I think, you know, we're going to have to look at how we slow traffic down a little bit there. You know, maybe work on the medians and make a bike lane. Everybody else is doing it. We can do it, too. They've done that in West Hartford. Sure. The They've done it in Cambridge, where traffic in Cambridge, Mass, where there's traffic a heck of a lot more than here. So I think we can do it. And, you know, people people do want to live in an area where there's there's things, there's restaurants. Oh, yeah. But they want to be able to get to them. They'd like they to walk. Get you know, in the car and drive across the street they, either. You know, now you can Uber a couple minutes away, too. <laughs> we want to yield to Attorney Peter, you can finish. I don't know how much time we have. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Please, Design review. There really isn't, and, and the reason that there isn't is because all of the information that we have is that we are dramatically overparked everywhere. That exactly to your point, which was that the six and the four space requirements that you have in your regulation really doesn't reflect what actually happens. That um, we build parking lots, not quite for day after Thanksgiving, but sometimes it seems close to that. And um, there are trends now in other communities where parking for apartments is down to 0.7 parking spaces per unit, 0.5 spaces per unit. Because people are walking, people are taking, they have better opportunities for public transportation. And they're working out. And, and <laughs> yes, they do that and they they're work. They're not just putting them in and they're not working. And they work from home. There's a, a yeah, great deal of that. So that uh, the, the parking demand where in, in suburbia where you say everybody has two or three cars in their driveway is not a demographic of people who are, are, are renting apartments. It's just not. So we're very comfortable. Mark has done this for us a, a number of times. And never had an issue at any of these developments where we were under parked. If anything, there, there's always more spaces than are needed. You know, those ULI numbers that Mark shared, that him and I have talked about it, 
the idea of renters by choice all being home or at almost a 98% level, whatever it is, between five and eight, we just don't see that. People people are out doing things. They're, they're not home, you know, sitting in front of the TV at that time. So. I have one final comment. I'll be quick out of respect for the applicant. I've been very patient. I think traffic is going to be an issue, especially with the uh, – you know, no left turn on the side of highway. So I think with the actual application, again, we're going to be looking at that a lot. Um, again, how it affects your current application as well as the previous application. So one more, one more comment. Um, can you can you speak to the separability of the two different proposals? Let's let's face it. One is approved. One is yet to you know to be heard. Um, if it were not to pass, is there an issue? I can't close. I you know. What I've done now is I've committed to two properties instead of one. And, and quite honestly, converting those floors from 39 to 39 units that are all one bedrooms or no bedrooms, the parking demand during the key times is, is a lot less stringent than if we had 30,000 square feet of office and medical. I, you know, th these folks in, in Wethersfield that are living in these, most of them are gonna have cars, because it's not an urban center. So they're gonna be leaving to go to work. So I think it's a, it's a tremendous improvement over what we were battling with, and rather than trying to co-manage it with another owner, we, we, we have complete control over the two parcels. Works a hell of a lot better. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so if we can, can we get rid of this? Uh, perhaps Denise can help us with that. Uh, wh when are we expecting the application? Do we actually already have it? Yes. Yeah. We have it. But I'll, I'll supplement it with some of the stuff that we talked about tonight. Okay. We have it. So I'm guessing next next meeting? All right, so we are going to remove, uh, return, remove, listen to me. We are going to return to uh, the agenda. Uh, item 3.1 is a public hearing and is on application 1979-18Z, Chipotle Mexican Grill, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 5.8, which is alcoholic beverages, uh, for a restaurant liquor license at 1080 Silas Dean Highway. Uh, so thank you for uh, oh, it's no problem uh, and and just so you recognize the math it's still five you need to be unanimous it's a, I'll leave it up to you to say that, that well, I'm, I, I'm prepared to what if I recuse myself because I know him after sitting through the last <laughs> hour and 20 minutes I thought I'd stayed away long enough that he would be gone would by be now gone. <laughs> uh, good evening uh, for the record my name is Michael Pease I'm an attorney in Farmington. I represent the applicant, uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill of Colorado, LLC. Um, as you know, they're seeking approval for a special permit that will allow them to then apply for the state of Connecticut uh, restaurant liquor permit uh, that will prevent uh, on-premises sale of alcoholic beverages at the, the Chipotle. Um, yeah, Chipotle, as you know, is, is fast, kind of fast family, casual dining, but as part of their uh, their business model and their sales model, they have very limited alcoholic beverage offerings. They typically offer um, anywhere between three to five uh, beer offerings. Some are local, um, some are a couple of national brands, and they offer two versions of a pre-mixed margarita. And that is the limit of um, the alcoholic beverages that they offer in the course of their, their menu. Um, it is a very limited component of their overall sales. The, the sales are roughly um, per store in Connecticut are about a million and a half to maybe a million 750 uh, on an annual basis. And alcoholic beverage sales comprise less than 1% of that in terms of dollar volume. But it's just it's part of their national model. It's what they do you know, throughout the country. And so they seek to, to you know, be consistent with uh, with each of their locations. 
So, so but that is the primary question I had. This is, I'll admit, I've never been to one, all right? But um, the, they they have alcohol as part of their normal, yeah. everyday model? Yeah, they do. Model? It's, it's behind the counter. It's not self-serve. Um, there's no bar area where you can sit, per se. So, you know, the way the service model works and the way we've kind of worked through the division of liquor control here with the state in terms of what they feel comfortable with, is that you would approach your, you know, you'd place your food order, and then as you move to make your payment, there would be beverages behind them. You make your beverage selection if you choose to. Then, um, the depending on your age, you will be ID'd accordingly. A manager would come over to make sure that the, you know, you're age appropriate for what you're purchasing, and you'll get you served your your alcoholic beverage, and you'll take that, and you go sit and consume your meal, and and, and move on. And is, is uh, service only with food? Yes. Yes. And not for takeout? No, it is not for takeout. So the, the license is on premises only, and that, that's all that's, that's Not permitted. in a plastic cup or anything? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> no. Do you have a drive through Yeah. So, go ahead, George. Yeah, it's a bunch of usual questions. Sure. Uh, and they ought to be answered quickly, maybe by Peter even. Uh, the distance from other uh, serving uh, you know, liquor establishments, uh, and the, is there a grouping or is there a tendency of it at this area? And I'm not sure I really get concerned with this, but these are issues we talk about. It is uh, part of your criteria, uh, churches, yes. Churches, schools, and uh, next, is it, it's, and I'll just to make a point, it's next to a package store, but that's, none of this stuff seems to be relevant to me, but I'm asking it. So the closest church would be the in the office building 1155 Silestine Highway at the corner of Mill and um, Silestine Highway in the back there, right? I think that's the closest church. Closest school, it's hard to see what school. It's probably the middle, the, the Catholic elementary school here. Um, so that's a significant di distance. In terms of uh, nearby, um, Similar liquor, uh, so you do have the, the you do have the package store in the Marshalls Plaza. You've got one across the street in the uh, Weatherfield Shopping Center. Um, you got the one next to Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, the Korean restaurant in next to the Dunkin' Donuts, which is one complex removed, uh, and then obviously also in the Weatherfield Shopping Center. Um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it an undo. Concent I wouldn't classify it as an undue concentration. It sounds to me like the, no, the, no, none, it doesn't apply very much. Anymore. And given the nature of this, this is, uh, as was explained to you, it's a bit of a unique uh, liquor uh, permit that they're asking for. It has uh, very severe limitations. and It's not like a full bar restaurant. No. It is, it is not a full bar restaurant. And they, they, they don't advertise it as such, and they don't you know, advertise drink specials or anything like it. It's just there if you choose to, you know, make a purchase when you're purchasing your meal. And the, and the margaritas you mentioned, they're pre -pot, they're bottled, right? It's all No, they're pre-mixed. They're okay. actually, they're, they're mixed, um, and they're, they're bottled per se, and then they're poured as, as you would order them. But they're not the, the bottled version that you might see at a package store, yeah. you know, the kind of the malt beverage kind of the thing. It's, it's not like that at all. And isn't the legislature talking about pouring in they are talking about the machines that will allow you to, to pour. Yeah, I don't believe that would fit with what the Chipotle uh, business model is, and I, don't, I haven't had any indication that that is something they would pursue. I'd be interested to see how that's going to work in real practice anyway. But so, so the other stores here in Connecticut have this same? That's correct. Thing. All Chipotle's in Connecticut currently the few locations we've had to get special use permits. Some, you know, we didn't have to. We Glastonbury too, which I've Yeah, the Glastonbury out. does as well. Yeah, West Hartford. Yeah. The locations in West Hartford too as well. What was the reasoning for not asking for alcohol when you first established the restaurant? You know, um, I will defer to whoever the site professionals were that represented my client at that point. I come in at the back end and that's the first question I always ask is say, well, you know, your site people took care of this, right? And they say, yeah, you're all set. And then when we called the office, well, sure enough, we're not all set. Okay. And that's, but yes, that sh quite frankly should have been handled at that point. Is there anybody from the public on this topic? 
Other questions? I move we close the hearing. Thank Second. You. Anybody opposed? All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, make a motion we approve application 1979-18Z as submitted. Second. Any discussion? I didn't think so. So I apologize for the long no, wait. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. I completely understand. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, we have some minutes. I'm sure you made his day. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I was debating whether to or not. Um, do we have enough to even pass? One. <clears throat> was everybody? I mean, Tony yeah. can vote on it. Even yeah, they can still vote on it. Oh, okay. George, did you read the minutes? Yeah, I looked at them. Yeah, yeah, I read them. And it, other than mine, a typo here or there, but there's no problem. So I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 All righty, what else we got going on here? Any uh, public comments? Um, anything for staff? Yep. What do we got? Yes, you have uh, under staff reports item 6-1. A discussion uh, yes. regarding fair housing yes thank you so uh, I reference a an April 12th memorandum to the Commission um, as part of our 2017 small cities grant which was a grant that uh, we uh, applied for on behalf of the Housing Authority uh, one of the conditions of the uh, grant was that uh, the town would look at um, its Basically, it's affordable housing uh, practices um, and have a discussion as to whether we felt they were, uh, the terminology they use is unnecessarily restrictive for families with children. So as part of that uh, requirement, I reviewed your regulations, which are summarized in the memorandum, to provide you with uh, a lay of the land regarding uh, how we presently uh, uh, allow housing opportunities throughout the community. So uh, the first part of the memor memorandum is kind of a breakdown of the types of uh, and uses uh, related to residential development that you permit uh, in, in the community. And when you lay it out, uh, it's a pretty substantial listing. Uh, it's actually 21 different types of uh, housing opportunities uh, ranging from accessory apartments up to the presentation that you saw this evening for mixed-use residential uh, types of development. So um, when you assess your regulations, um, you do uh, provide uh, a wide variety of housing uh, opportunities in the community. Um, secondly, we looked at the definition of family, which in many communities uh, restricts housing opportunities. Uh, when you narrowly define uh, a, a family, um, uh, big argument in Hartford over that. Yes, uh, it's been a big argument uh, in other places as well, but uh, I, I did provide you in this memorandum a definition of family. Your defini definition is very broad, um, and it reads, any number of individuals living and cooking together as a single housekeeping unit, whether related to each other legally or not, and shall be deemed to include domestic help, but not to include paying guests. So as I said here, it's a very broad definition when you compare it to some other communities. Um, and so that does support opportunities for um, families um, and expanded families, non-traditional families to uh, have housing opportunities here in town. Additionally, you do allow in your regulations uh, the ability for people to take in boarders and lodgers. I'm not sure if many of you knew that, but uh, in your definition. Why you asked what you did at the last meeting? I'm sorry, George, what was the question? Didn't you ask that question about did we have a concern about regulating uh, renters? You know, well, maybe you were uh, more a bed and breakfast, but yeah, this is this is different than that. But okay. but nevertheless, um, y folks can if they want to um, rent rooms um, in in certain in three of your residential zones. So that is, uh, I wouldn't say it's unusual, but it's um, once again uh, provides uh, opportunities for for people uh, to live uh, in in single family homes. Uh, also, uh, we took a look at your building, uh, your subdivision minimum lot requirements. And once again, um, 
you allow uh, relatively small building lots, uh, some cases as small as 6,000 square feet in a traditional subdivision. Other zones allow 7,500 square feet. Um, and then even in your cluster subdivisions, lots can be as small as 7,500 square feet. So once again, uh, your lot minimum lot sizes are not uh, overly restrictive and are quite permissive. Um, additionally, your SRD zone, which is your, your standard multifamily zone, um, we actually, when you look throughout the community, there are 35 different development sites in the SRD zone right now uh, existing um, that permit, once again, a whole variety of densities and housing opportunities. So uh, ranging from six units an acre up to 25 units an acre for high-rise uh, multifamily developments. So once again, um, a pretty permissive set of regulations for multifamily development. Um, one area maybe that could be looked at and reviewed a little bit more is your minimum floor area requirements. Um, one bedroom units uh, in your SRD zone have to be 600 square feet. Um, they get smaller when they are um, offered for elderly and seniors, but um, I, I haven't really assessed how you compare with other communities, but that's probably an area that if you that, wanted that to one area I look at. concern when I read it was, I still think elderly housing 400 square feet minimum is ridiculous. I mean, 500 should be the minimum, but mm -hmm. you know, hey. Uh, I mean, and I, I come from housing background. I had 20 years of state housing department, supervisor, planning, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking down elderly housing down in Meriden, old stuff. I mean, 50, 60 years old, but it was down in the 400, oh, they said 400 square feet, too small. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'm out of it and I'm not. Yeah, I think the 400 is, but I, but the 600 maybe for one, I, it's, I, I don't know that it's a, a big problem, but it, it's probably, it's something that, you know, you could look at if you were so inclined. I don't, it's not a, those aren't shocking numbers, but um, it, you know, at some point it might be worth just assessing how we, how we uh, compare but to other communities. But development will come up with sizes of units that make sense to them market wise. Well, you heard tonight the studio, the studio, which is, which has a high demand. We don't even have a standard for that. So um, in the SRD zone, it's different in the mixed use zone, but so that's maybe just one area. Um, in oh. terms, you also allow mixed use residential and commercial development, as we saw tonight. Uh, you adopted those regulations relatively recently in 2008. You allow those in four of the town's six commercial districts, um, and you allow that density up to 25 units per acre, which is also very uh, permissive. Uh, the only uh, other thing that once again, uh, could be looked at is in the old zoning regulations before 2004, you had affordable housing provisions. Um, there were incentives in, in some of the multifamily zones before they were all consolidated into the SRD zone. Right now, you don't have any language in your regulations uh, dealing with affordable housing. Um, so once again, that might be an area at some point uh, we look at. Um, so you, you should just be aware of that. Um, in summary, uh, the town has a fairly diverse housing stock, and uh, even, even though most of the land in, in the community is, is already developed, uh, you do allow housing opportunities at a variety of price points, uh, which creates you know, a naturally occurring affordable housing in the community. Uh, and then lastly, in summary, your regulations, uh, as far as I'm concerned, do not act as an impediment to fair housing, um, and you've made amendments uh, since 2004 that provide uh, additional affordable housing opportunities. So um, so I wanted to present that to you. Uh, and as I said, it's required as part of our uh, grant uh, opportunity. If anyone had any strong feelings about uh, this summary, uh, I can certainly incorporate that into the report that I'm going to provide I, I to them. Peter, I think you did an excellent job on this. and. It pleased me to see the town was as good and is in good shape along these lines. And uh, I, I don't know what the State Department of Economic, uh, State Department of Housing, I assume is now, uh, will say about it. They're planning people, but you know, it look, might look at this stuff, but it looks darn good to me what the town allows and provides. Yeah, I think when you compare it to what other towns require or provide, you know, I, I don't know that we really need to 
do much in the way of affordability incentives because you know there's there's already enough opportunity for density that um, you know goes above and beyond what some places do as an incentive right. and I guess talking about the minimum floor area do we have any residential developments in town that are at the 400 or 500 square foot um, you know units because I just don't I don't remember anyone coming in and you know maybe a HEPA or something like that has you know relatively small units just because of the nature of the housing arrangements but uh, you know I don't I don't think anybody's come in and complained that 500 or 600 feet is too high a minimum for for what they want to do no I haven't I haven't heard a complaint and the only reason uh, I mention it is that that information is not readily available without going back and reviewing each of those projects and figuring out what the square footages were so um, the only reason I mention it is it's not information that's readily uh, available and um, once again uh, I have not compared it against other communities so uh, I don't see it as a huge uh, um, difficulty but it just the, the, the statistics weren't readily available No, I, I also want to compliment you on the comprehensive review. I mean, I've seen other towns' efforts to respond to that grant requirement that, you know, haven't had as many clear opportunities as, as we do. Yeah, they couldn't make any kind of a case for the number of uh, ex-urban towns in this state, no question about it. No, I mean, actually, we've, we've been engaged to write regulations that create opportunities in places that, you know, don't even go as far as what we already have. All right. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, anything else other than, uh, you know, we've got some pending applications coming up? Good. Uh, you may, uh, the 1881 Berlin Turnpike project, if you've been up there, has started. Um, it's always interesting when a site is cleared and you see it for the first time. So, hole in the ground in the front part. Yeah, so uh, that is uh, underway. Um, it's the pool. So that's the most recent. Oh, probably. Hey, you didn't tell us about that, Peter. There's a pool in the front. <laughs> Luckily, there is with all the rain that we had, so it at least well, stayed on the yeah, on the site. Probably right. That's I correct. Yes. That. So. Um, <laughs> We did have the ribbon cutting today for uh, Pasta Vita, so uh, please uh, um, shop to your heart's content. There, there's a lot of lot of choices. A little bit overwhelming, so uh, I think you'll be pleased when you when you I, go in I there. I went there and they gave a very nice parting gift, a nice meal, worth about twelve bucks for anybody that went, and and it was good. I had some. They gave away uh, to the first fifty customers today uh, free entrees for a year. So you can imagine people were camped out wow. out front. So so that's open. We also went to the River Cafe at Putnam Park to do the final um, or at least the temporary uh, certificate of occupancy. So they should be opening uh, within the next week or so. So uh, I can't remember now because it changed. It's changed several times. I, we were out there today and we were trying to make, make sure we had the most recent plan because it's it's been a moving uh, target out there. But this is the outdoor, outdoor patio, uh, not the patio part, but the deck yep. portion, the, the patio on the banks of the river they're putting to a future phase. But um, the actual cantilever deck um, uh, is uh, looking to get its certificate. So um, they got a few things to do, but uh, they're getting very very close so uh, we'll let you know when that um, ribbon cutting is held but um, it should be a should be a nice experience there so they did a beautiful job at pasta the other day. yes they did beautiful a really high-end presentation they very well done yep. yep they do so okay anything else motion to adjourn thank you second, second yeah. <laughs> thank you all those in favor say aye Hi. Hi. Nice. What's he doing? <laughs> you know, I thought you were talking to me in the email.